All right, cool. So let's go ahead and get rolling. So first up, as always, is agenda bashing. Um, so if we go ahead and look at the agenda, we've got a lot of action item reviews. In fact, most stuff is action item reviews. Um, and then we've got you know some time to review new items for the following week. Um, so uh, anything else that folks want to add to the agenda that's not currently listed or that you'd like to bubble up to higher priority since it is a kind of a crowded agenda at this particular moment? Cool. All right, so diving right in then. Um, we had an action item for last week for the setting up of a project board. Um, I believe that actually has been completed. Um, so you can actually go and let's see if there's actually a link from the issue, but there's a project board here, which I think we'll probably try and use more of as we go, <coughs> um, that lists a bunch of the different items that we have as issues that are either to-dos or in progress. You know, so things like publishing the images to Docker Hub or checking out SRIOV and packet.net so we can get going on the SRIOV use case. Um, and so, I mean, as we go, I think, you know, we may start using this more for the agenda rather than sort of trying to describe everything by hand, but we'll have to see. Does, do folks have thoughts or opinions on this? I mean, I like, I like using the project board, so I have no issues with it. It seems like it duplicates work if you have to manually update it every week, so I'm thumbs up on this. Yeah, I, I, I tend to be as well, but I was kind of curious if other people had thoughts. Um, so maybe for next week, we can start using the project board for the agenda. Does that make sense to folks? Yes. Cool. <clears throat> All right. Awesome. So drilling further down. Uh, so Kyle, it looks like there was an issue you had with GoPath in the make files and that, that appears to be fixed. Yep. Frederick opened that and he actually merged it, I think, earlier in the week. Cool. Uh, so the, the next up was uh, Frederick had taken an action item. So the CNCF folks have um, a lot of cluster resources from packet.net for real hardware. Um, and they have been kind enough to allow us to apply for access to it. And I think we've actually been granted access at this point. Um, and so a lot of what we're looking at there is there's certain kinds of NSM use cases for which you need physical servers, particularly the ones that inv involve getting your network service from a physical NIC or an SRIOV from a physical NIC. And so I believe that's moving around nicely. Um, I believe that's done. Um, so if folks would like to start shipping in in that direction, reach out to Frederick. He can add you to the access list and we can start drilling into some of that setup because you know there is a bit more to servers than just dropping code on them. So uh, we also had a, a big move uh, in terms of describing what NSM is. Uh, Frederick put up a, a doc talking about what NSM is. Um, do you want to drill into that here? There we go. Um, and we can actually follow the link, I think, to the doc, not just the issue. There we go. So um, basically just adding a bunch to the existing documentation to walk through a high level uh, overview in prose of what network service mesh is. Um, and this is actually incredibly helpful. It, it turns out Frederick is really good at prose, uh, and I am really not. Um, and so I think this will be really, really good for us. Um, do folks have any opinions, thoughts, or comments? Hey, mm -hmm. um, the document's really good. It was really useful. I'm still a little lost how to get started with building a new NSM plugin. I looked at Sergi stuff, which is really good as well, examples, but I'm a little um, lost in the trees, you know, from the forest. Okay, no, that, so that's, really that's, that's completely fair um, and, and points to something that we probably should take an action item on me for, which is to document a little bit more how plugins work 
and how the plugins we have fit together. Is that, is that getting to is that getting to be what you're confused about, or is it something different? Yeah, exactly. I mean, how would I, you know, do an end-to-end -end example? I mean, Sergey's simple um, data plane is really good. Mm -hmm. I kind of I've kind of figured it out. But if I wanted to build my own, what would I have to do, and what YAML files would I have to do if I had two endpoints I wanted wanted to connect? Like I had a, you know, a simple REST API between two nodes. How would I do that? And use the simple data plane to do that. Okay. Because I think are then you, take are you looking examples on how to stand up, you know, a pod that connects to a network service endpoint. So you could take yeah. a point and, and go. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Matt, can I can I inject just a quick comment? Uh, there is a excellent script integration test and like I would use it as a baseline for basically mimicking those steps on the local cluster because I mean everything is very generic there there are I, I mean at least I don't recall any any big dependencies on the Travis or uh, on the CI so if you follow step by step bringing those pieces at the end you should be able to ping between those two con those those two pods um, if you hit any issues, I mean, please make sure that, I mean, you let me know and uh, we could, we could, we could look into it together, debug it a little. So, uh, I'm totally open for that. That's so, but I, I said in the, you know, the chat, uh, IRC is, it'd be useful to put all the new extensions in, a, in separate directories. So you can have a readme and all these files in the same place because you guys are working on it day in, day in, day out, know where all the files are. I look at it and I'll go, which file is a core piece of the platform, which piece is an extension. I can go and look at each individual file and figure it out, but it's not um, that productive. And if we want other people to use it, it's like, here's a way to extend NSM. Here's where you plug in your pieces, you know, basically yeah. cut and paste. Yep. So could you, would you be willing to do the following for us, John, on this, which is, would you be willing to open an issue and just lay out the simple use case, a couple of the simple use cases you want to know do what documentation on how to do, just so we can get a crisp statement of, you know, what it is that you're looking to have documented? Yep. Yep, no problem. That's a great idea. Um, John, my next step after the initial getting started guide of just how to get the cluster going and NSM started was to try to do exactly that, um, maybe in the same document or a second document. So I'd be happy to help you, uh, work with you on that. Great. Well, let's get together. We'll work on it. And then this is this is actually why I was asking if we could get a crisp point on it, John, because you know I, I told, when you say I need more documentation, that's a completely credible statement to me, independent of context at this stage in the project. Um, so the question becomes, of all the basic documentation we could write, what might be more helpful? So, cool. Awesome. Um, shall we go back to the agenda then? Thank you so much for driving, by the way, Lucina. It's very helpful. You're welcome. So I think next up on the agenda then is, um, Adding, so we talked about adding documentation to talk about what it is. So next up actually, Tom, is your getting started guide. Um, and, and there was some requests for additional review on that. Do you wanna talk to that a little bit, Tom? Yeah, I just uh, got comments from two more reviewers. Uh, I was in the process of responding to, um, to Fred's comments and, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I have some, uh, a comment or, or a response I put in the bottom of the review to re, uh, mm -hmm. comments by yourself, uh, um, Ed and um, and cool. Sergey, I think somebody else. I think it was Sergey. Oh, Pratik. And uh, just uh, please place a comment in there if you agree to it, and I'll keep this going. Hopefully, I can get this wrapped up in, yeah, yeah. And, and I think, in a few I think days. I think I know I definitely agree, and I think Pratik would agree that NSM, you know, having documentation that could allow people to who are not as familiar with Kubernetes to get going with it is really important. Um, the, the the thing that was sort of rolling around, at least in my mind, and I suspect also in Pratik's, is the thing you want front and center is the, 
you know, cube control, apply dash F kind of thing um, that lets people just, who do know Kubernetes, just go from zero to, to Yeah. So I'll put a, like I stated here, I'll put a comment on the top saying if you already have a cluster up or you're really familiar with the cluster, then go straight to step X. And then that will have the basic, you know, All right, uh, nice. uh, go get um, to get the, the, the repo, I mean, to get the code make and then Kuba control apply. Yep. And hopefully shortly we will have um, Docker images published. So if you just want to run it, you can just run the cube control apply. Yeah, that's my big, uh, big thing I'm dealing with with the earlier thing is trying to figure out what to do if the Docker images are not published. And that's a little more complicated of getting the Docker images into the cube control cluster. Yeah, I, 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 I make sure I have that process in here just in case. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that even once, which by the way, I have a patch that, that uh, publishes those. I have not pushed it out because I've been traveling this week, but I, I plan to do that uh, Monday. But, but even with that, I think it's still important to document the whole process of how you build it and everything. So I think yeah. your, the work that you're doing, Tom, is super awesome. Well, I figure that even when these images are published, you know, more images will appear for other, other uh, elements and other demons. And uh, it would be nice to, to know, um, exactly. You know exactly how to get a Docker image into the cluster without publishing it first, which, which isn't... Um, tremendously difficult. I also got a comment that people say, well, you know, just start the cluster without a VM. And it really doesn't make any difference, except for I think people are a little intimidated by nested virtualization. You need to start a daemon if you're already working in a VM. And I think like, like a container and cluster and Kubernetes people just don't like <laughs> the VMs are unfamiliar to them and they say, well, look, we got Kubernetes and stuff. We don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. But what I was thinking was like, if we're going to do a, a real, like I think Edge, when I logged in here, like I think it was Ed, Ed said, if we're going to do a, a, a service that includes a base data plane that's hooked to an underlying um, software data plane and a host, we're still going to need some of that old fashioned VM stuff like vhost user for at least the bottom level layer two service or the bottom level of presenting the, the fast networking interfaces. So that's why I thought it would be good to have this documented, but I'll also add that, uh, you, that you don't need it just, just to run the code. No, I, I think it's actually incredibly useful to have it documented because one of the things that, that, that happens is it's all, it's all fun and games when you get the cube control apply dash F for people to be able to kick the tires. That's awesome. And then somebody actually needs to deploy it for real. And that's never quite as simple, right? Right. They, they, they wind up with a bunch of details that are not a big deal if you just want to see it working. But if you want to you know, do things that involve getting you know, fairly optimized performance, um, you, you may have some other things, particularly when you get to space where you're talking about physical NICs or SRIOV. Uh, things get interesting. Yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, Either oh. with physical NICs or make sure that whatever is underneath um, in, the, in the host or the VM that contains whatever VM is running our cluster, uh, at some point we're going to need access to fast uh, data, whether it's uh, virtual or physical underneath us. So that's my thinking in sort of a generic way. So yep. and yep. to do that, we're going to need um, a little bit of virtualization, maybe. I don't know. That's it. Yeah, I think we all are on the same page around the documentation. The comment I added was only like thinking in two different perspectives, one from one of the end users and one is from a developer who joins a new project. So if an end user comes in, they don't want to build everything. They just want every image which every project already has. They just they can just install in their own cluster. And if a new developer joins us, then he needs all these commands for sure. So this documentation really helps. So, so I was thinking in these two terms so that it will be helpful for both end user and a developer. But yeah, documentation. Absolutely, we need, and we all are on the same page, I agree. Is it okay if it's in the same document? I think that was Pratik talking, or yeah. do you really think it has to be two documents? That's the only, my only pushback on your comment, because I can edit the document to say to go to step no, 17 or whatever it is. Okay with 
the same document. Yeah. I'm, but, okay. So one, thing right. I will, one thing I will throw out there, and this may just be an artifact of my own psychology, but the, the wall of text effect for me, my psychology at least is real. And so a, a long multi-step set of directions, I find to look more like a lot more work than a short giving started summary. Um, mm -hmm. In my own psychology. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So let's see. Next up on the agenda, we've got um, the becoming a Kubernetes working group member. So this is still somewhat in progress. Um, I, I've been having some conversations. There were some comments on the PR that was pushed, um, essentially asking about what network service mesh was. And I've talked to some of the people who asked. And so there's still a little bit of bouncing around as to various opinions as to whether we should be a Kubernetes working group, uh, you know, a SIG network sub project, uh, a CNCF project or a CNCF working group. So I'm trying to get some of that resolved. Um, it's taking a little bit of time. I'm not hugely upset that it's taking a little bit of time um, because there are a bunch of folks who I think are critical to the conversation who are out on PTO for the next week or two. Um, so that's sort of like, stalled is a little bit too strong of a word, but it's still in motion. Um, I don't remember the check for de deprecated Kubernetes API calls comment, apparently, that I made. Um, I, I do generally advocate for clear errors uh, to tell you how to fix things, but I, I, I literally don't remember this. I apologize. Does anyone else remember that item? Okay. Uh, is it is it something related to the uh, Go client, which was um, moved from client seven to client uh, to client version eight? That might have been. I mean, the the yeah. I mean that that, that very well may have been. Um, you know, it, it's it's fundamentally down to um, you know. I, I I think I've made this comment several times. I'm generally of the opinion that you should fail as early as possible and as clearly as possible um, with as good at instructions on how to fix whatever it is that you can't resolve yourself as you can. So, but I, I don't remember specifically, there was actually an issue that was open, it looks like, but it's not, it looks like Frederick may know more, but he's not here right now. Okay, cool. So uh, next up on the list is we have, uh, Frederick was looking at SRIOV on packet.net. Um, I think we have several people who've been poking around at SRIOV on and off of packet.net. Um, do, do any of the people who've been sort of poking in that area want to comment some? So it looks like um, Ian Wells went out and checked to make sure we could get SRIO VNIX on Mellanox based the, the Mellanox NICs that are present in uh, PacketNet. Um, and there were some outstanding questions about whether bio settings might have to be mucked with and what that would take. Um, does anyone happen to have any, bit, any more visibility or any more knowledge on this? So I, I did speak to Ian this week. I, I believe that he thought we were we were good to go because I believe that he also so it's my understanding that the packet machines might have those Intel either five ten or seven ten cards as well, which he was pretty pleased with that, and I believe that he was able to confirm the SRI, SRIOV support for whatever Mellanox cards were there. Though his only concern was the number of of uh, VFs that Mellanox cards exposed versus the Intel cards. I guess the Mellanox are lower, if I recall from what he told me. Yeah, I recall him saying that they were exposing something like eight. Now, it's important to realize I've chatted with the packet guys a fair bit, and apparently they generally standardize on Mellanox NICs. But right now, for some of their smaller, older machines, they're running MLX3. And then for um, sort of newer, larger machines, they're running MLX4. And they would like to get to MLX5, but apparently that's really sort of hot and fresh right now. 
And I think that, and you know, Taylor, keep me honest here. I think that some folks were finding that the driver supported DPDK for MLX4 and MLX5 is enormously better. And thus your ability to actually do meaningful work with them is much better. Does that match your understanding of the world, Taylor? Yeah, the very, very difficult with three. It's already hard enough with um, four, the Connect X, uh, four cards. And as far as I know, there's only um, a few types right now at packet.net that have them. There's, uh, I think, a couple of X larges and one medium. I don't think anything else supports the um, version four. Okay. Um, and so, cool. So if you could add a comment about those flavors to the issue, that would probably be really helpful. Does anybody else know a lot more about sort of SRIOV on the Melanox cards who might be able to suggest useful information? Uh, yeah, well, I can send out info. Uh, we've played with them for a long time, as you know. Um, so uh, we're mostly using uh, MLX, uh, MLX5, though. We, haven't, we have completely skipped the three and fours. So I, I will send info on the fives. Okay. Uh, I, I, I sort of do have a question, which is, as we get a little further along, would you have any interest in sort of, since you've got MLX fives in your lab, in, in sort of helping out and testing how these things are going against MLX fives? Because apparently it's very Oh, yeah. I will, I will be pleased to do so. Oh, that's marvelous. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, because so, I, I think the next thing, at least for me, the next thing up I kind of want to get working um, is some of the insert a hard, you know, have a hardware NIC or an SROV channel that provides a network service example. That, that's kind of the next one in my head uh, in terms of use cases. Uh, please note, if you have other use cases in your head you want to work on, please do that too. Um, yeah. <laughs> the only thing about open source is it can all work in parallel. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to work on... Um... Vhost user is a first use case, which is a sort of virtual analog to um, virtual functions, if you will. Okay, so you're, you're thinking about Vhost user as sort of a mechanism, an alternate mechanism to a kernel interface. Is that correct? It, exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. Cool, awesome. Awesome, so we can definitely talk more about that. And if you want to open an issue to track it, that way, hopefully, it will be picked up on the project board um, as we go forward. Um, would you be willing to do that? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Cool, awesome. So um, then L2 forwarding with VPP example, I think this is probably what you were doing, Sergey. Do you wanna update us on, on what's going on? I think some things have merged. Uh, right, yeah, I was, uh, I started looking at the VPP and the way how to interact uh, between the NSM and the VPP. I hit a couple of roadblocks, uh, they were uh, resolved, but you know, while waiting on um, on the answers on the, the VPP related things, I kind of uh, moved a little bit and uh, implemented that uh, simple data plane just to be able to run end to end in the CI. So um, I have a couple of things to finish. Uh, with the simple uh, data plane in terms of the cleanup, and then I can uh, start looking at VPP again. Because uh, the documentation, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a bit hard to see how to interact with, um, uh, with the VPP from the NSM code. Okay, no, that, that's, that's totally fair. Oh. Uh, cool. So we, we do have this other issue out where Ed, Ed from Packet Cable was kind enough to send us a typo fix but we still need the signed off by. So uh, if you're out there, Ed, we would love your fix, but please, for the love of God, sign it so we can take it. Um, cool. So Pratik, are you here? You want to talk about the sidecar containers, um, stuff that you're working on? Yeah, hi, I'm here. So uh, the code is mostly done. The only challenge I'm facing right now is adding up to the CI with Minikube. So Minikube, works in one of the implementation like uh, so there is a step in our process where we need to get approved get a certificate approved and issued by the kubernetes api server so minikube has these two modes where you can run with the local cube where everything is one binary which only works on travis and the other mode which is uh, which is powered by cube adm doesn't work on travis 
So with the local queue mode, the certificate does not get issued. So that's where I'm blocked right now. I was talking to Kyle on on the IRC. So once we move to Kubernetes uh, on packet, maybe that will be the right approach to go. And then over there, we, we can get the certificate approved and issued by the API server, which will unblock us. So uh, I added all the comments in my PR, but it's still failing. I need to address those issues because it's failing in the CI. I, I tried a lot of things. I tried using the Ubuntu 16.04 in Travis, but that's not officially supported. So we can't move there yet. If we move to Ubuntu 16.04, then we can run Minikube uh, in, in Cube ADM mode, which solves the problem. But for now, we'll have to just use Ubuntu, what Travis supports, and run Minikube with local Cube. So that's where we are. Okay, cool. I appreciate all the effort. It sounds like you know one of these things where you just hit a niggling detail and it's been taking a little bit of working out. So yeah, I mean. Uh, I tested it out on my cluster, on Kubernetes cluster, it worked fine. And then I moved everything to Travis. I thought in Minikube it will just work, but then it didn't work. Then I installed Minikube on my Mac, it worked, but it was not working on Travis again. Then I did it on Linux, it didn't work. So I figured, I narrowed it down to this uh, uh, settings to local cube and not running without local cube. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's it from my side. Awesome. Yeah, uh, but document the settings both ways because I'll need to make sure I'm consistent with this and what I'm documenting in the getting started guide too. Uh, I thought it was just a question of, of uh, which driver you start Minikube with, but um, maybe I'm oversimplifying it. Uh, it's, it's the driver, but it's also they have this mode where who starts all the Kubernetes components? Like, so does all the components run as part of one single binary local cube or cube ADM bootstraps the whole cluster? So that's the difference here. So driver part is a, a step before that, like how all the VMs or the infrastructure is running. But this is more how do the bootstrap Kubernetes on top. So I have this command linked here where I detail everything for Minikube. But let me know where you want me to add all those details. I'll add it there also. Sure. Yeah, critique. I, I, there's, I just wanted to add a couple of things that, um, so number one, the, the local cube thing is actually going away in a future release of Minikube. Right. And this makes many people sad if you go and look at all the issues opened on Minikube because, because of the fact that people are using it in Travis. But it's also worth noting that local cube works outside of Travis. In fact, Minikube stopped working for me on, in my setup and it only works now if I use local cube. So uh, there's, 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 there's a bunch of bug reports on this as well. Um, so I don't know, kind of a, kind of uh, yeah, local, chaotic. Local cube works for me. Everything comes up. The only uh, issue there is a bug with local cube is it doesn't issue a certificate which for which there is already a, a issue filed against mini cube. Like in local cube mode, it doesn't issue you a certificate. That's the only challenge. But Got it. if I don't run in with local cube, the issue is resolved, I get the certificate issued. So, so there is no problem. But yeah, I don't have any preference with local cube or other mode. I just need the certificate issued. So it's not working in local cube mode. Okay. Yeah, that's the only thing. Okay, cool. So I think next up is, um, amusingly, we've got our perennial um, you know, item about agenda, uh, uh, about a mascot. I've kind of been sort of using the um, um, Ariandre, uh, Ariande uh, spider that I used in the narrative deck. Um, I don't know if we can bring that up and see how people feel about it in general. Um, we would need to go and, and eventually get our own version of it made. This one was purchased from a stock uh, graphics company. But um, do, do folks in general like the friendly spider as a mascot? That works for me. Yeah, the, the, the only additional suggestion I, I think that came by, someone was suggesting, you know, we, if we were to go get our own version drawn, 
um, to perhaps have the spider knitting. <laughs> a spider with knitting needles, yes. Exactly. <laughs> knitting everything together. Cool. So it sounds like we've actually got you know, folks feeling fairly good about that at this point. Um, all right. So um, then next up, Kyle, publishing images to Docker Hub. You sound like you have a patch almost ready to go. Yeah, exactly. I worked on that earlier in the week, but I've been traveling uh, since Wednesday. So um, I'm hoping Monday, well, I should be able to get it out Monday. I just, I just need to rebase it after everything that went in this week and just make sure everything still, still is good. And then I'll uh, push that out Monday. Cool. Awesome. Do, do you have any plan like which images do get pushed? Like for every build do we push or are there any specific images? No, no, no. I, my plan is to only push on merges to, on, on pushes to master. We're not oh. going to, we're not going to push Docker images on PRs when people push PRs. Okay. Yeah. Just when we merge it to master, whichever build gets generated, we'll push that. It, it, exactly. On a successful, you know, once something gets merged to master, master and then the build is successful, then we'll publish a Docker image at that point. Sounds good. And this, this hopefully will also help with some of the, as we build up more system level tests and packet and hopefully with the cross cloud CI stuff, having the binary artifacts to, for downstream consumption of that stuff, I think will be really good because, you know, yeah, I, mean, I think that'll be really good. So uh, Taylor, did you update somewhat, you know, are you, do you want to talk about the um, support things that you guys need for the CNCF CNF project? By the way, there are too many C's, too many N's, and too many F's in that, that name. <laughs> ah, there are. <laughs> um, I think we want to hold until we get some of the testing that we're doing right now on the uh, CNFs on packet. So I think when we figure out what we can do with this first network function, then we'll be able to describe those parts. We are working on the, I guess, the use case, a write-up for that. We'll add that in. Um, but beyond, beyond that, we'll want to get the, the rest of the details from the current testing, which probably at least this week, um, so uh, this coming week. So potentially end of that week, we'll, we'll have some results that we can share. That would be awesome. Cool. And, and it's we totally Mm -hmm. so you're still figuring things out. I mean, so are we all. So, awesome. I just want to make sure that whatever. So, Taylor, Taylor, are you trying to implement this in NSM or is this separate? So, right now, um, we're doing some comparisons at a, I guess, a much simpler way. We're using um, Docker containers and Docker to have the containers and uh, KVM either direct or with libvert, we're, we're talking to um, KVM compared to the VMs. And we're doing all this on packet. So um, we'll, we'll try to share any of the information on like the network cards and stuff, especially on that other ticket uh, for the SROV. Yeah, I'd be really interested, especially how you're doing the traffic steering part of it. You know, this is something that's... We'll find for what coming. part? How do you how do you do traffic steering into the CNS or the VNS? Yeah, so I will definitely have to make some adjustments when we jump um, from the what we're calling box by box. We're we're just doing the just as minimal as possible down to the container, as minimal as possible to VM. When we go into what we're calling orchestrated, so Kubernetes, and we're looking at comparing that to OpenStack. So that's kind of the goal. Um, that's going to make it more complicated. At the moment, we're on single systems, so a single packet um, node for each of the tests. We'll be doing the multi-node, multiple physical machines, and that's we're keeping that in mind for how we're sending the traffic between um, the containers and the test. The container running the network function and the test containers. So. Yeah, I'd be um, I can send, I can share a link if if you want. But go yeah, ahead. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, would be good because we're working on the same kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I think a lot of the stuff that we're doing is 
kind of a little bit preliminary where we are right now and then it's going to be leading directly into what y'all are doing so there's going to be more and more overlap um, which is why we have this ticket <laughs> i actually published a sample vns cns on github it's just as a packet end map in and out that might be a useful test vehicle if you're interested sure yeah we have a, this specific ticket. It's talking about this VCP use case. So there are a set of network functions that we need to implement. And this is requested, like here's the goal is this use case. Um, if, if you have example additional ones, um, that's I, I think a goal that we want to have is, is more than just this use case. It would be great to say here's other use cases. Um, be a good way. But yeah, happy to help. Yeah, please share the link to that uh, GitHub. It'd be great. Cool. All right, then. So I think the next step that we had was working out documentation infrastructure. Um, and I think this was uh, Frederick sort of saying, OK, look, um, we're starting to document things in, in Markdown, which is awesome. Uh, you know, sort of migrating these all to docs, migrating to Hugo, um, adding Go docs support, that kind of stuff. I don't know how much progress has been made on this just yet. I, I generally like the direction. Um, so does anyone have anything to add to this particular item at this point or any interest in getting more involved with it? Well, some stuff is working. I mean, if you put your doc in, in docs, it'll, it'll render. So you just have to go back to the readme and make sure the link is correct. But everything seems to yep. create a pop down. You know, it, it renders the build, uh, the markdown files just fine. So I don't, I think there's, a, he had far more in mind with that, but uh, that stuff seems. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's definitely progress going on. Um, Okay, cool. So I think the next item we had up on the agenda was, so I suspect this is something you know something about, Sergey. Uh, this item around stop relying on dollar sign host to identify pod. Um, uh, yeah, that's correct. So at, uh, at one point, um, we, from the NSC perspective, I needed to pass host name uh, to the NSM to be able to register uh, the relation between the channels and the host name. So uh, when then NS, NSC uh, terminates, then I could f actually identify which channels were advertised by that specific host name, which belongs to the uh, X or old NSC, and then clean those channels from the uh, references. Uh, well, uh, Frederick mentioned that it's not very reliable uh, way and uh, so he I think he was gonna uh, investigate for a more reliable way I mean frankly I don't see why it's not reliable because uh, names name and namespace guarantees the uniqueness in the kubernetes so I, I, I from my point of view it's good enough but I guess uh, he probably came up with some corner cases when it's not sufficient yeah I think so the Oh, hi, this is Pratik. So the pods host, host name you can change from inside. And I think the most reliable uh, way is, and also promoted by Kubernetes guys, is using the downward API. So you can add this information in the pod spec itself. So when, when Kubernetes starts a pod, they add this information in a file and you can read from that file or they set an environment variable. So that's the recommended way to do it. I I, I, I'm a little bit nervous about ongoing creep in terms of how much modification has to be made to pods in order to use network service mesh. Um, so I, you're, I, I totally agree with you. You can bring this in via the downward API, but we would like network service mesh to be as easy to add to pods as we can. And having to add more and more and more things to the pod spec past a certain point starts making it difficult. Uh, at what if we do it uh, conditionally? I mean, if downward API is there, we'll use it. If not, well, we'll just use the host name that pod provides. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of, of um, I'm a huge fan of, of doing cooler shit if it's available and not requiring it. Um, you know, if you can get more information, I think that's awesome. Um, the other thing to, that, that I want to mention just to keep in mind is we have this really strong tendency, which I think is completely healthy at this stage, to think about network service mesh completely within the context of a single cluster. But as I look forward out into the world and places I expect this to be used, um, we will have instances of people wanting to connect to network service endpoints that are outside the cluster. Um, so for example, um, I know that in the NFE cases, there are, all, you know, there are physical network functions that are always going to be with us. And we've talked about a little bit about having external NSMs that would make it look just the same to everyone inside the cluster. But the guy living on the other end of that connection is not necessarily um, you know, running in the cluster. I don't think that actually has impact on this particular case because when you're talking about the NSC to you know, sort of node local NSM API, that intrinsically means you are running in the damn cluster. But it's worth noting so that people can keep that in mind so we don't accidentally preclude some of the really good use cases with external uh, network service endpoints. So it looks like I hopped on just in time. So I can explain why hostname is not a good idea to always rely on. Uh, I can be heard, you can hear me okay, right? Because I'm on an airplane waiting to get out. Um, yeah, we, we can hear you just fine. Yes, we, are, Great. we, we hear you well. Okay, so here's, here's the problem. The host name is a settable uh, variable. Oh, we lost you now. I think we just lost Sorry. you. Yeah, I got a phone call and then I so I just canceled it. Uh, so the Kubernetes host the host name is a settable variable in the in the spec in the in the pod spec. So you can say host name equal web, and then all the pods that spin up will have a host name web. And so when we do Q, when we do uh, Q, the uh, Kubernetes uh, client get host name, we're going to be, I'd be asking for the web host name and there's going to be no such name because your pod is not named web. It's named whatever, whatever the, it's internal name is. That's, that, that is no longer uh, what, what, what was said in the host name. What would have been said as a host name had that variable not been set. So the, so the problem is like, typically if, if they don't set it, then it's, then it's reliable. You can, you can get the, uh, the host name and it matches the name. But if it's not set, or rather if they do set it, then we can no longer rely on that, on that technique. And so, so just so I understand, the, the, the thing we're, we're thinking through here is uh, in order to be able to do cleanup, um, you know, Sergey needs some kind of identifier he can go back to use to figure out what went on. Is that more or less the thing, Sergey, or have I botched it? Have we lost Sergey? Or, or the new <laughs> I think we lost Sergey now. Uh, so, sorry about that, guys. Uh, no, uh, basically, yeah, uh, when the NSC gets deleted, I get name and the namespace of the port which is being deleted. So I have to use this information to be able to match what we have registered on the NSM side for that NSC. So that's why, I mean, I need some sort of a reference. Um, something that we may be able to do in order to to work this out is we'll have an agent running on um, on NSM or sorry we'll have it we'll have an NS, NSM agent that uh, that is running on each uh, on each uh, node and so one option that we have is uh, perhaps we can leverage information additional privilege information that that may have access to, like looking at, at Docker, looking at the name of the pod, uh, because that information is, if you do Docker PS, you can potentially correlate that with the, uh, with the namespace. So we, so, cause we have the namespace ID, so we can potentially correlate that to the exact uh, pod that, uh, that we need to gain access to, or yeah. that we need the name of. There are some other things we can look at, for example, because we have the namespace ID, we could run FS notify or something similar 
across the var run NetFS, uh, NetNS directory um, and watch for the disappearance of the files for that namespace there. Uh, that's another kind of thing we can do. The problem with that, and I, I, I realize this because Sergey pointed it out to me, is I think Sergey is right now striving to minimize the amount of state that we keep um, in the NSM um, because that way we don't have to, to squirrel it away someplace in case the NSM gets restarted. Um, and so, so the, 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 pre, the there, it's one thing to get the information about the namespace and use it. It's another thing to keep it as state so you can clean up later. Is that most, more or less capturing your position, Sergey? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I have this sort of vague uh, gut feeling that we are going to wind up having to keep state, but there are so many advantages if we can avoid it that I'm actually quite encouraging of trying to avoid it at this stage. And I mean, I'm, I'm a bit surprised. I mean, um, like for the Kubernetes, having a name and a namespace, it's a sufficient proof of the uniqueness. I mean, why we cannot um, uh, follow the same model? I mean, well, it's, it's not an issue of, the, of a lack of uniqueness. It's an issue of access to the name of the variable has the host name. So the host name is not guaranteed to be the name. And so we cannot rely on, on that to, to capture the name. Okay, okay. In this case, I will, like, I will trace the, where I use the host name if I still use it. And I make sure that I use pod, pod name and the namespace for that. Yeah, so, and the reason, well, I the reason I created an issue as well is uh, it turns out that before you put in that patch, there's other instances of it as well, where the name is being used uh, from the host name. So that's why I created the issue. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not only about the patch that you pushed in uh, or we're, we're looking at, it's, it's also, there's also other instances that we need to fix because when we get a pod with a, with, with a host name that's been over, overridden, then we're, we're gonna see failures. So. Isn't this like a generic Kubernetes problem? I mean, if they're pushing out broken data, I don't understand why everyone wouldn't have this problem that's using the API. Oh, oh, oh. It's not broken. That's, that's the trick. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's oh, it. Wait, so, you're, so wait, hold on. So you're telling me that if, that, that if someone names something, puts it in the database, then changes it later, they're pushing out the old name still, or they're giving us the new name? No, no, what, what he's telling you, what he's telling you, Kyle, is that host name is one of the following two things. It is either whatever the hell was configured in the pod spec to use for host name, which may have okay. nothing to do with the name or namespace of the pod, or if you fail to configure it so that something is configured, it will configure it to something that reflects the pod name and namespace. But because that is a fallback position from the user actually configuring it, you can't rely on the host name being unique or having any, any relationship with the pod name and namespace ID. Okay, that, that makes sense. So I guess it is a problem if we are using host name somewhere and trying to map it to some value in Kubernetes. Is that, am I understanding the problem correctly right. now? No. I think so. You know, okay, yeah. that, that makes sense, yes. And I agree that that's wrong if we're doing it that way. Okay, cool. And thank you so much for Lucina for cap capturing such good notes. That's hugely helpful. Um, all right, so let's see. On the agenda, do we have... Okay, so I think in, we've got on uh, upcoming items for next week, we've got using the project board for agenda. So please do make sure to get issues in because they automatically reflect there. Um, and I think um, because John has this knack for catching the action items, um, we do have a create an issue requesting a document on how to stand up uh, a pod and connect to a network service endpoint so we can get a good idea of the documentation that John most urgently needs. Um, does that sound about right to folks? Do we have other kinds of action planning for next week we want to do? Other than the fact I think we have a lot of things already in motion we're going to continue. Okay, um, anything else before we conclude for today? Awesome, thank you. Talk to you guys later.
Thanks. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.